how can we turn an electronic circuit design from beginner to pro? In this video review, I would like to go through some of the common design mistakes that designers make when starting out, and I will give some tips on how to improve the design to make it professional and take it to the next level. The project we are going to review is an STM 32F4 custom project, and it is basically the first fully independent project that the designer of this board wanted to create to start learning printed circuit board design. This is a board with six layers, and it includes a USB on-the-go interface, an SWD interface to program the microcontroller, and several other peripherals, as well as general programmable input and output pins. That said, now let's start the review starting from the electrical schematics, and then we will take a look at the layout of the board. One of the first nice things that we can see here is that this project already follows a structure. This is quite nice, as for larger projects, the structure makes it easier to organize, and it also makes it easier when sharing the project with other people. Now let's take a look at the schematics. The first thing that we can notice here is that besides the name of the project itself, I do not have much information that immediately describes the project. So at this point, I don't really know what to expect from the project. Since this is the overview page, or root page, as KitKat calls it. Ideally, I would like to see here an introduction to the project. For instance, a nice catchy title for the project, how the project is organized, a revision name, and so forth. So this page that we see here could be a secondary page instead of the first one. Then we can see that we do not have much information, also regarding the designer and the contact information, in case something is not right and I need further explanations. Even a simple email address would be nice here, so that I know who to contact for more information on the project. What is also important here is to have a revision and version number. This is important because I can immediately understand if this project is compatible with previous versions or not, or even if this is the first version of the project. Now let's discuss the general look of the schematic. At first glance, the schematic looks clean. However, I think there is still room for improvement in terms of tidiness and attention to details. Now let's have a closer look at each of the schematic pages inside each block. Let's start from the main block representing the microcontroller unit. Alright, here we have the symbol representing the microcontroller schematics. The first thing that we can notice is that many of the things we just discussed, such as the lack of the title, the designer information, and so forth, are also lacking here. The second thing we can notice here is that the schematic is not really well organized, and it can be a bit confusing when looking at it. Zooming closer to the connections, one of the things I would improve here is the orientation of the power symbols. Ideally, you want to be consistent with your design and try to avoid confusion when placing the symbols. Also, one thing that I would avoid is using the long wires that go over the entire schematic and cross other connections. Especially crossing the connections can be confusing when sharing and printing the project. Even worse, when reviewing the project, it can be hard to understand if there should be a connection between the wires or not. And this will not be detected by the electrical rule checker. As for the components and naming of the values, it is usually not necessary to add the unit of measurement, as this should be intuitive because of the symbols used. For instance, a capacitor should not need to have the farad symbol next to its value, as this should be pretty intuitive already. Also, instead of using the dot to distinguish the decimal value, we can use the unit itself to separate the decimal value from the integer value. For instance, instead of using 2.2, we can write 2u2 to indicate that this is a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. This is useful to avoid any confusion when we share the design, again especially when printing it, as the dot can be hard to see sometimes. The next improvement here is the net naming. I see that many nets here lack a net label, and this can create confusion when doing the layout, as the PCB editor will automatically generate random net labels when no net has been assigned from the schematics editor. This is also important because when we add the net label, we can immediately identify the net we are inspecting. One thing that I would also improve here is the additional clarification for the circuitry, 
For instance, it would be useful to add some notes here for the layout stage on how the components should be placed on the board. In the case of these decoupling capacitors, it would be useful to write a note here that indicates to place the capacitors as close as possible to the pins of the IC. Moving on to the symbol. In this case, the symbol is divided into functional blocks, meaning all the pins are sectioned into their corresponding block. I usually am not a fan of symbols created following the pins number from the footprint, as this often complicates the design of a clean and well-structured schematic. Here also, the ports have been added directly to the wires, which I would instead place at the edges of the schematic sheet and divide into input and output sections, according to the left to right convention used to immediately identify the flow of the schematic. The last comment that I have here is regarding the name used for the power symbol. Although VDD is okay to identify the power, it gives me no much information on the voltage that I should expect on this net and it does not really indicate the polarity of this voltage. Using a plus or minus symbol here and adding the expected voltage, if this is fixed, would help me identify the type of net faster without the need to go through the whole design or datasheet in order to find this out. Now let's move to the ST-Link programmer page. Here as well, same improvements as before. We can improve the schematics by adding a clear title then by sectioning the schematics into clear blocks with appropriate descriptions, and this will improve the schematics readability. It's important that we don't think just at the moment when we are designing the schematics. First of all, because the project should be easy to understand, also for all the other members of the team that have to work with it, but then also for the designer, because chances are that in a few years from now, you will not remember all the information necessary to understand this project. That is why I think it is better to add this information on the schematic so that in the long term, everybody is happy with your design. Let's now take a look at the first USB circuitry. Here, one thing to be careful about is the lack of filtering or protections, specifically electromagnetic interference protections. The cable that connects to this USB can be quite long and could easily pick up some noise that will couple to the cable. The opposite is also true. I will have to be careful that noise from the board does not escape from the circuit and couple into the USB cable and even worse, radiate. So my recommendation is to always check inputs and outputs and make sure that you have protections in place. The other thing here to be careful about is the indication that the USB connections have some specifications to comply with and a specific impedance profile that should be met. For these nets, we really want to be aware of preserving the integrity of the signals and design these traces accordingly. Now let's move to the other USB schematics page. What we discussed before, of course, applies here as well. In particular, I would be very careful here with the crossing of these nets. It can be very confusing to understand where the wires are connected to. Also, this is the USB with high speed rates. Therefore, I would include notes and the right labeling for the nets to separate them from the others and to indicate that they will need some special attention. The same goes for the protections. I would always try to be extra careful in taking appropriate measures. Now let's move to the final page for the schematics part. In this section, besides my previous comments, I would also add to be extra careful when having reset signals in place. The way this is connected would create a short circuit between VDD and GND. Even when the resistor R33 is not assembled, it will create some problems because the capacitor here will be shorted to the ground when the switch SW1 is pressed. The rest of the circuit lacks descriptions, so it will be hard to understand what these circuits are about unless I take time to read their datasheets. Of course, if I've used the IC in the past, maybe I don't have this problem but remember that other people should also be able to understand it. Okay, now that we have analyzed the schematics, we can also review the layout. For the PCB layout, the same tips I shared in the schematics design also apply, meaning the title of the project, the contact information, and possibly the date of the project should be visible. Moving closer to the layout, we can see that the layout looks as if it was unfinished. From an aesthetic point of view, it has room for improvements, 
Also, at first glance, it seems that this layout will most likely experience some issues along the way, due to the way the layout has been designed. Before we go more into details on the layout, the first and most important part we should take a look at is the stack up of the board. As we mentioned earlier, this is a six layer board, so we need to be careful about how we choose the layer stack. One of the things that really helps when deciding on the stack up is to think of layers and pairs. What I mean by that is to always to think in terms of signal layers and a return layer. I know that many in this field would select the stack up primarily based on cost. In my opinion, this is a killer for the design itself as with a bad stack up, the cost might look lower at the production level, but will then increase when trying to rectify issues that a poor layout will generate. Included in these issues are electromagnetic compatibility issues of all sorts and signal integrity issues such as crosstalk, ground bounce and so forth. So here we see that for six layers, we have only one official return path, which is the GND layer. I say official because although the power layer is probably going to be used as a return path from layer six and layer four, this can create other issues if not well managed. The problem with using a power layer instead of the GND layer in this case is that yes, the signals on layer six and four will use the plane in layer five as a return layer, since this is most likely the layer with the least impedance for them. However, the return current that goes through the power layer to close the circuit and return back to the source will still have to close the current loop and return to the ground layer, where this return current from the power layer to the ground layer will find a way to close this loop. This is hard to predict and it can generate some other sort of issues. Even when adding decoupling capacitors, we are not really resolving the whole issue as decoupling capacitors are real components and far from being ideal. Capacitors not only have capacitance, but also inductance, which completely changes the impedance profile of the capacitor. The only thing the signal and its current care about is the impedance they see along the way from source to destination. So this is what we should really take into account. I would not go much into details here, but my suggestion is to always think in terms of signal and return as a pair that cannot be broken. Now let's take a closer look at the layout of the traces. Starting from the first layer, we can see that this layer has both power traces and signal traces. At first glance, the traces look to be routed very close to each other, and this is usually not a good sign, as this can create crosstalk issues. The other noticeable thing here is that some of the traces are routed long and also very close to the edge of the board. One issue here, since the trace is so close to the edge, could be damaged during manufacturing, which could potentially create problems with the connection. Then the other issue here could be from the fringe fields of the trace, which depending on the type of stack up used and the signals going through it can create some issues and radiate. Zooming closer to the connections, it seems to me that the traces are not designed with a controlled impedance profile. Also, I see that there are some short circuit issues regarding some of the nets. We can also see that the traces are larger than the pads in some cases, and I would generally recommend not to do that. Next, let's move to the USB connections. Here, the traces, as we mentioned in the schematic part, should be treated with extra care, as the signals in these traces are quite vulnerable to impedance changes. Also, the track that goes here around could be designed differently without the need to go around the USB connector at all. As we said before, it's super important to place the protections and some sort of filtering in general when we have input and output connections that are an extension of the board. As for the microcontroller, I see that it doesn't have the decoupling capacitor placed near it and this can as well cause issues, especially with high demanding applications. We can also see here that we have some 90 degree corner traces. I think that this problem is often overestimated and that since the problem they cause is the change of impedance due to capacitive effect, I would change it of course, but mostly for aesthetical reasons. I don't think that for this type of connection, it would create issues. However, this is generally not a good practice to carry around. One important thing to notice here is the placement of the oscillators. These components will carry high harmonic signals that need to be routed properly, and I would definitely avoid having long traces with these types of signals. 
Now let's move to the second layer. This layer is almost well designed. What I really like here is that this is a solid, almost uninterrupted plane, which is exactly what we need as a reference plane for the signals in layer 1 and 3 with this layer stack up. What I still would improve here is the space between the vias, because with this configuration we are creating a slot in the ground plane that will not be ideal for the signals referencing on layer 1 and layer 3. Layer 3 seems to have the same issues, with traces far too close to each other, and also being too close to the board edge. Here, I would definitely use the space I have in this layer to really maximize the performance of the board. Moving to layer 4, the same things apply. The space on the board could be used better here to separate the traces a bit more and avoid crosstalk. And from what I see, layer 3 and layer 4 are probably not even necessary here, or at least the signals could be part of a single layer, instead of two. Let's now move to layer 5, the power layer. In this layer, we have the power nets that feed the power to the components of the board. Unless we have a high current demand and really small space for routing traces, I would not use power planes. This of course would depend on several different things, but in most cases having a power layer is not really necessary. The power can be routed as traces and the layer could be better used as a return reference layer instead. What is more important to note here is that even when using power planes, as in this case as a reference layer, we have to provide the signals that reference this layer with an uninterrupted reference plane without splits, cuts or sectionings as in this case. We have to remember here that layer 5 in this case is the reference plane for layer 4 and 6. This is the layer where the return current generated in signal 4 and 6 will flow back and try to close the loop to return back to the source that has generated it. If this path is not the path of least impedance, the return current will find better ways and probably not the ways you wish for. Moving to the last layer, we can see that also this layer does not have many traces routed in it. So this confirms what I thought before, that this board could be better designed with a 4 layer stack up, which would also reduce the costs and improve its performance. As for other general improvements, this design unfortunately lacks the manufacturing and assembly datas and other specifications that I would add to the design. In this way, when the board manufacturer receives the files, they would know immediately what to do without the need to go back and forth with emails or calls, which would only delay the fabrication process. Another general improvement that I would add here is the addition of return vias when crossing layers. In this case, as we only have a single return reference plane, we would need to use stitching vias plus decoupling capacitors to the power layer and layer 5 which would require an increase in the bill of material cost and engineering time. Now let's see the 3D model of the board. We can see that some of the 3D models are missing here, and I'm not sure if it is actually because of the version of the software I'm using or because of the library used. The next thing to notice here is that the design from the 3D point of view looks clean, although it misses important information for the user. We could improve the overall aesthetic of the board by adding logos, labels and adding important information for the user, such as power levels, descriptions of the connections, debug and the description of the switches. If you are a professional looking for a printed circuit board design program that will help you take your skills to the next level, then check out our website at fresuelectronics.com.